What's up my fellow kings and the 5.6% of queens that watch my videos. I'm finally back with a part 2 to the series after a short hiatus. If you're new to this series, this video is covering the best boxers in every weight class from strawweight to heavyweight. In part 1 I covered strawweight which is 105 pounds to the featherweight division at 126 pounds. For the most part I'll be covering the top 2 guys including if there is a lineal and ring magazine champion. In some cases, depending how stacked the weight class is, I'll be discussing the number one to number four ranked fighters. So sit back and let's start the video. So since I'm pretty late starting on part two, the rankings in this division has changed a bit. In this case, I will mention the top four guys. Tevin Farmer came to the 2020 year originally ranked at number 2 in the world with the record of 30 wins, 4 losses, and 1 draw. Since his loss to Pedraza in 2012, he stacked up a 25 fight win streak, including winning the title in mid to late 2018 and making 4 successful title defenses in less than 1 year, which that is highly impressive. Farmer his whole career was just beating the odds after the odds. He started boxing at the late age of 19 years old. He had a rough start to his pro career, not having the flashiest record. Despite moving up in the ranks with title contention coming near, unfortunately he couldn't get the Davis fight. Mayweather said to this man, he will never make 1 million in his career, putting this dude down even more. Farmer got shot repeatedly in the hand and was able to recover and finally be able to fight for the title. It ended in a controversial decision, then it was later changed to a no contest because Ogawa was using a banned substance. Farmer in the second go took no chances and completely shut out Billy Dibb for the title. And he made not only one mil, but he made a lot more. He didn't listen to the critics, and he didn't listen to the man who most looked up to when it came to making money and succeeding in the sport. So mad props to him. Ranked at number 3, 21 wins, 2 losses, Jamel Herring. Herring served in the United States Marine Corps from 2003 right out of high school as a 0331 infantry gunner and had 2 tours in Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom. He had quite a bit of a success in the Marine Corps boxing team winning national titles. In 2012, he became the first active duty Marine since 1982 to compete in the Olympics for boxing. After Olympics, Herring really came onto the scene big in 2019 when he beat WBO champion Matsuyuki Ito. Ito was one of the best fighters in the division at the time. He won the title in America and won in an impressive fashion to where he left a good impression on American audiences and critics right after he got signed immediately to top rank following after a successful title defense there was high expectations for Ito to once shine again. Herring caught him with that unexpected heat and defeated Ito. Herring would make his first title defense to end the year off against undefeated Lamont Roach Jr. getting a unanimous decision victory. With pretty much my mom's whole side serving in the military and my big bro just finishing up his service in the Marine Corps not too long ago, I'm genuinely rooting for this guy. Recently promoted to number 2 in the rankings, Diaz is 31-1 with 15 knockouts. He is the current IBF champion. The road to his first world title, due to the politically dividing lines, and just by luck, I believe, since Diaz did not have an exclusive contract with HBO, after jumping several hoops to become Russell's mandatory, then in a rare sight, Diaz was able to cross these politically divided lines and fight Gary Russell on Showtime. Unfortunately, Diaz was not able to win the title, and his second title run, it was for the WBA featherweight title. Unfortunately, he was not able to make weight by 0.6 of a pound and was ineligible of winning the title. The fight did end up going on, and it looked like it was time for Diaz to move up in the weight class despite beating Jesus Rojas. Diaz will fight three fights before getting a shot at the IBF title against Tevin Farmer. Despite being grossly cut early in the fight, Diaz was unaffected by the cut with thanks to an S-class cut man, he was able to stop the bleeding almost completely. Diaz was able to fight on and win the title. It goes to show you that three times is always a charm, or the third time is always a charm, something like that. At number one, is Miguel Brichelt. 
37 wins, 1 loss, and 31 knockouts. This guy is an absolute monster. His only loss was uh, just going by how fights go in Mexico. It was an uncharacteristically early stoppage by the referee. And since then, he had turned into a fucking Terminator. He won the title against Francisco Vargas in brutal fashion, then to just steamroll through everyone. Out of the seven title fights he's been in, Takashi Mira was the only guy who can say, I went the distance with Prichelt. At this point, he's on the road to becoming one of the best fighters of this era at Super Featherweight. Takashi Uchiyama ruled Super Featherweight for six years. Looking what Prichelt is able to accomplish in three, I would say he's here to stay for a long while as champ, especially at the young age of 28. Haney is one of the fastest rising stars in the sport. He is the current WBC champion, 24 wins, no losses, and 15 by knockout. When he became pro, he had his eyes on the prize to get into the position for a title shot within two years. Haney's fight schedule was very reminiscent to Mike Tyson's when he was coming up. Haney was able to rake in 17 fights in less than a year and a half becoming pro. By the time he was fighting for his first regional title, he was already a household name in the world boxing community. 2018 and 2019 was incredibly busy for him, raking in six fights, all six being very important title bouts, making him the mandatory and to become the champion. The sky's the limit for Haney from the looks of it. It's just gonna keep on rising for him. 15-0 and 12 knockouts. Like Haney, Lopez is a quick rising young star in boxing. He really blew up and got the attention he needed to put him into a position for these big fights thanks to his raw talent, the way he disposed his opponents and his personality. He's an easily marketable TV friendly fighter. In 2019, being his defining year, defeating undefeated IBF champion Richard Kami in an impressive fashion. Also, incredibly young like Haney, the sky is also the limit for these guys. 14, 1, and 1 with 10 knockouts. Vasil Lomachenko. Lomachenko is a three division world champion and the current lineal champion and holds the WBA and WBO titles. He is the man to beat at lightweight. It's going to be very interesting to see how this weight class plays out this year. Ranked at number 2 is 25-0, 17 knockouts, Jose Ramirez. Ramirez became the champion in 2018 for the vacant WBC title, defeating hard-punching Amir Amin. Ramirez cemented his status as one of the best in the weight class, beating Maurice Hooker in a unification bout for the WBA title. Currently, Ramirez is supposed to fight his WBC mandatory opponent, Victor Postal. The fight was supposed to happen earlier in February in China, but due to the spread of the coronavirus, the fight was postponed, then moved to Fresno, California in May. That's pretty scary to think because the earliest cases of the virus on paper was in December of 2019. Some say as early as November. This fight was signed to be in China in October. And if it wasn't for foreigners becoming infected and turning this into an international case when it was being kept secret, it would have been contained within the Chinese government and never made public, resulting in this fight still happening in February without the promoters and the fighters' knowledge. Taylor's road to success was definitely a a fun ride. He got international attention when he beat boxing prospect O'Hara Davis in a meaningful bout for the WBC silver title and British Commonwealth title. Four fights later and big wins over Ryan Martin and Victor Postal, Taylor beats Ivan B for the IBF title. In the junior welterweight tournament finals, he was matched against Regis Pagrias for all the marbles. Taylor, in an inspiring performance, edges Regis for the majority decision victory, making him the man to beat at junior welter. Who would have thought in the year 2020, Manny Pacquiao will still be one of the top fighters to fight? Manny holds the WBA title. He had a big 2019 year defeating Adrian Broner, but the most meaningful fight to judge if Manny actually still has it against world-class competition Competition was against Keith Thurman. Manny proved he still has it and convincingly beat Thurman, but unfortunately, the scorecards were unusually too close for comfort. Personally, I scored it 115-112 for Pacquiao. Thurman did have his moments and exploited some huge flaws in Pacquiao's game and did not follow up on it. He also did not come out and fight the championship rounds, which even if it's a close fight, not fighting those rounds can indefinitely lead to a loss. It will be tough to see who Pacquiao fights next. I can see him beating other guys in the division like Danny Garcia. 
Ranked at number 2, 36-0, 27 knockouts, Terrence Crawford. Crawford is a three-division world champion. He became the first undisputed champion since O'Neal Bell in 2006, when he fought John Mark Mormek for all the belts at Cruiserweight. Just to quickly clear things up, odd enough, Bell never received such credit. When Jermaine Taylor had vacated the IBF title, which is a requirement to have to become undisputed champion shortly after beating Bernard Hopkins in 2005, that was later picked up by Arthur Abraham in late 05. 2007 becoming the first year that the WBO was recognized by all belt organizations as a legitimate organization, which now requires you to have that belt to become undisputed. Bell earned all those belts before that took effect, and he deserved to be credited. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to speak out as he passed away in 2015. Back on track here, Crawford currently has a WBO title and the man that will define his entire career is Errol Spence Jr. And he's the number one ranked fighter in the division. Spence Jr. is the IBF and WBC unified champion. He has made four successful title defenses of his IBF belt. The fight to be made is between him and Crawford. It's going to take some time to make because of these politically divided lines between top rank and Al Heyman, but this fight is too big and meaningful to the sport for it to fall out. Due to events in 2019, we'll have to wait a little bit because of the almost life-ending car accident that Spence was in. He is currently back in the gym, whipping himself back into shape, and I'm expecting him to have a tune-up fight before any anything serious, either if it's a Crawford fight or anyone else worthwhile at the welterweight division. Just upsets left and right, and once again, the IBF and WBA title changes hands, and the man to fight now is 21 and 14 knockouts, Jason Rosario. He stopped Julian Williams and won the IBF, WBA, and IBO titles, which slingshotted him into the top two rankings. 33 and 1 with 17 knockouts. Charlo is now a two time world champion. He just avenged his only loss against Tony Harrison for the WBC title. Due to a lot of events happening in 2019 and early 2020, Charlo jumped up from number 6 in the rankings to number 1. So you can finally say he's back and potentially can cement his status in the division if he fights Jason Rosario. <laughs> If they do fight, since this fight will be for the WBA, IBF, and WBC titles, and since Charlo is ranked number one and Rosario is ranked number two, it's now for the ring and lineal title as well. Also, since Heyman and PBC does not recognize the WBO as a belt organization, you can say this fight is unofficially for the undisputed title. Okay, this division here is like too much to go through and will make this video incredibly long. I will hope everyone knows the fighters in this division and I will briefly go through all of them to save time. Maybe one guy uh, I'll, I'll talk more about. Charlo is a two division world champion and the current WBC champion. Demetrius Andrade. Andrade is a three time world champion and the fight to see him in is with Jamal Charlo. Both being rivals to an extent, mainly because of several failed attempts of trying to fight each other, which I covered in detail in my Charlo Heard video. Ranked at number one is Gennady Golovkin. He is the current IBF and IBO champion. His last fight for the belts, despite his opponent being pretty underrated, Golovkin did not look all too well, which fight fans think he's starting to age. Personally, I don't think he has progressively aged as how some may perceive it. There are two different Golovkins. There is a Mexican style Golovkin who was really dedicated to mixing it up to the body and the head. This Golovkin was incredibly dangerous and that is how he was able to set up his KOs, TKOs and truly wear down his opponent round by round. Then you have Triple G Golovkin, which had formed after the Lemieux fight. This Golovkin no longer goes to the body. He's more of a headhunter, relies too much on his power, and has completely forgot how he was able to decisively steamroll his opponents thanks to mixing it up and keeping them guessing. If this Golovkin doesn't come back, his future at the top in this incredibly stacked division 
is numbered. He is the lineal and WBA and WBC franchise champion. I still need to do my research regarding that belt. My only assumption is it's supposed to be like a WBA super title, but can also be given when you retire as the champion for whatever reason, as it's also designated as the emeritus title as well. It is just too many titles. It's a really confusing, but whatever. IBF champion, three successful title defensives, so far number two in the world, and uh, I don't know, he's fast and everyone wants him to fight David Benavides. Next guy. Ranked number one in the world, holds the WBC title, he's in the history books as the youngest super middleweight title holder, winning at the age of 20. Like I said before, everyone wants him to fight Caleb Plant. With the drama between the two, will it happen? I don't know. We'll see. The man in the division is Callan Smith. He's a big motherfucker. 6'3", 78 reach. Jeez. He's a WBA and lineal champion. Dimitri Bivol, ranked number three in the division, has made five successful title defenses of his WBA crown. I'm really hoping to see him unify in the near future. Is ranked number two in the division, he was the former WBC light heavyweight champion. This division really didn't start getting interesting until he was named the mandatory for Adonis Stevenson. Stevenson, who had not fought a mandatory opponent in five years and somehow avoided that, was this time forced to fight Alexander. Despite a new change of hands and the end of quite a disappointing era in light heavyweight boxing, Alexander lost the title to the next guy who was ranked at number one. Arthur is an incredibly hard punching fighter, 15 wins, all 15 by knockout, but he was awfully promoted to where I'm positive it was purposeful because his promoter was the same guy who was promoted by Adonis Stevenson where full effort promotion wise was being pushed towards him instead. For Vaughn Michaels' defense, Peter Bidev is not a marketable fighter and his uh, minimum rate of 250000 per fight is not worth to search for meaningful fights in which he didn't get any and he was stripped of the title. Lawsuits were filed and Arthur ended up losing, but he was finally able to leave that promotion. He got picked up by top rank and immediately his first fight being signed was for a title. Less than a year and a half, he's unifying a division and he finally showed the world his underrated hidden talents being the best in the division. It's crazy how changing promotions can completely change someone's career because this man was being shelved gathering dust on the level of Guillermo Rigondeaux. Makabu is a WBC title holder. He is a fun fighter to watch, very TV friendly, big power, 27 wins, 2 losses, 24 by knockout. His only real loss was against Tony Bellew, which that was a really exciting fight. Yanil Dortikos and Meris Brightis. I'm just going to mention both of these guys. They're fighting next month. Dortikos is ranked number two and Bradis is ranked number one. They are unifying against each other for the IBF and lineal titles. Okay, so due to Joshua losing to Ruiz last June, that had knocked him out of the number one rankings. Since beating Ruiz, he is now at number three in the rankings, while holding the IBF, WBA, and WBO titles. And once more, Joshua due to the verdict of Wilder Fury 2, Joshua is now at number one in the rankings. Wilder is now at number three. And Dylan White, who pretty much been in boxing's version of Purgatory, is now ranked at number two. Last and finally. Tyson Fury has the ability, and I think in my expectations, will be the next superstar dominant heavyweight, much along the lines of Lennox Lewis and Vladimir Klitschko. Very talented for a big guy, unbelievable coordination, a uh, lot of showmanship and personality and charisma. The lineal champion is Tyson Fury. Fury is a two-time unified and lineal champion. Well, Fury's doing it from a distance. Or it has to be the big man in the pack. Fury on the back foot as Johnson. The winner of this fight could fight the winner of Steinman against Ariola for a... I think what we need to see from Fury now is maybe a few more combinations. Fury was asking uh, the break between rounds of a side on enough. Concerned about his technique almost. First time he became the legitimate champion was in 2015 against Vladimir Klitschko. I feel like he didn't get the full credit he deserved. There were critics that were quick to say that Vladimir was old. 
Then when Fury retired and put on all that weight, those were the very same critics that were harsh on his road to losing all the weight and his comeback fights to not giving him a chance in the first Wilder fight. Despite putting on a show and prove to the world that he is back, they still kept on putting the man down. And on February 22nd, 2020, he shut them people up once and for all, stopping Deontay Wilder. And on top of that, I'm glad to say the series is finally fucking over. What a marathon. Be sure to like, and if you're new, subscribe. Follow me on Instagram for more video updates, memes, boxing news, whatever. I am Alfred Sancho, and I'm out.